Okay, thank you for your patience. We are, we are good to go. So good morning. morning. There we go. Yeah, we've checked in. We've prayed. We're ready to roll. We are in Route 66. This is the 50th book we've looked at. This is amazing, I think. We've got 16 more to go. And then we will have worked through the entire Bible. A book a week. And so we're in the book of Philippians today. And I'm really looking forward to teaching this. Um, I have heard, maybe you've heard people say this thing, this as well. Uh, that the church would be great if it weren't for people. Yeah? I have uh, somebody close to me who says that people would be great if it weren't for the church. Okay. <clears throat> so either way, however you want to look at it, I might have been guilty of saying that phrase at some point in time or another. Either way, it, it, we know that the church, whether it's the universal church or a local church, every church has problems. And the reason for that is because people that make up the church have problems. And so how are those problems solved? How do we work at resolving difficulties, problems, trouble, whatever it might be? How do we help people become the people that God wants them to be? How do we help the church become the church that God wants it to be? It's why we have the New Testament. It's why we have the Bible. The Bible was given us to teach us how to know God through Christ and how to live the Christian life in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so last week we looked at how the church, or one of the analogies or figures of speech or pictures of the church is that the church is the body of Christ. We are Jesus' physical representation here on earth. And we learned in the book of Ephesians last week how the church as a body can be stronger and more healthy. The week prior, we looked in the book of Galatians about how the church can be set free from being imprisoned to man-made rules and regulations about what it takes to be pleasing to God. Today, we're going to focus on how to create and find joy within God's family. Joy. And joy is, what we're going to see, it's not circumstantial. A sense of well-being and happiness and contentment does not come when things are going well for us. We can be even in the most challenging season of our life and still have this sense of peace and joy. <clears throat> we're going to look at that a little bit today. But before we do, I want to do a preview and introduction to the book of Philippians. This is a letter written to a group of people in ancient Philippi in Greece. Philippi was once a thriving Roman colony in Greece. And it was named after the father of Alexander the Great, King Philip of Macedonia or of Macedon. And Philippi was a favorite place for Roman soldiers to live once they had retired. So it's a big retirement community. Think Southern Greece, think uh, Southern United States, you know, Phoenix or Florida or something like that. You've pretty much got this idea of where retired people go when they're done working. Philippi was very much like that. So the Apostle Paul and his team arrived in Philippi. It was a major Roman colony, and there was no synagogue. It was Paul's tradition, his method to go into a Jewish synagogue because he was Jewish and open up the Old Testament and start preaching about Jesus. Well, <clears throat> in whatever community there was back in the old days, you couldn't have a synagogue unless you had five male Jews, Jewish males, living in that community. And there weren't enough Jews in Philippi to start a synagogue. Now, Paul was hoping to find some Jewish people to whom he could present Christ and so he went to a place, according to Acts chapter 16, where he assumed Jewish people would be gathered for prayer. And where would they gather? At the river. At the river. And they found a lady named Lydia. She heard the gospel. She believed and she was baptized. This is where Kathy Jones was baptized <laughs> last July. 
who baptized her in the same river where Lydia was baptized. She even wore purple. Kathy, you're wearing purple again. Look at this. Yeah, good. Lydia was a seller of purple fabrics. And we just talked about her in our Bible study on Revelation. Uh, we did the, le- the, the little memo to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2. That's where Lydia was from, was from Thyatira. So a little overlap as we go there. Uh, the city now is in ruins, the ancient city. So you go there and you just see indications of what used to be there. Not much left, but still an amazing place to visit. From the top left corner, there's a theater. And then there's the main street. And there's the marketplace in the bottom right corner. This is where the Apostle Paul was beaten and arrested and imprisoned. So it's fascinating to be on location, to be reading the scriptures or to get baptized. Uh, on location. We're going to be there again in July. If you want to join us, we'd love to have you join us. Just ask. Uh, Don't ask me to pay for the trip. Just ask me (laughs) what you need to do to pay for the trip. So let's look at some introductory information about the book of Philippians. In 10 words or less, it's a short little summary that I like to provide every week. Philippians is a friendship letter between the Apostle Paul and the beloved church, a group of people that he loved very much. This church had a special place in his heart because it was the first place, as we're going to see in just a moment, where people responded positively to the gospel. The first place in Europe where people responded to the gospel. The theme is joy in Christ. And the key verse is uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. We're going to unpack that idea in just a few moments here. So that's where we're headed. So I've already had a chance to talk a couple of times this week with people about this particular cartoon here, this particular graphic. And uh, so what do you see? You see a ball? What's he doing? He's humming. So he's humble. Uh Uh-huh. Humble. Yeah, and he's flipping ends. So Philippians, flipping ends. Humble, yeah. Okay. I do that just to kind of cleanse the palate before we get into the, <laughs> <laughs> the scriptures. So the major theme, the major focus of the book of Philippians is that a healthy church is known for its joy. Church is not all about having a party, or it's not always about having fun, but there ought to be joy and there ought to be some fun. And I'm glad to hear you chuckling this morning. It's a healthy sign. It's healthy also to have to try to quiet you down before we start church. Although you get out of the building pretty quickly, you have to work on that and make you hang out just a little bit longer. So 16 times in the book of Philippians, we find the word joy or rejoice. So an average of four times per chapter. And so the question we're going to try to answer this morning is how do we find joy? What is the source? Where do we go to get it? How do we hang on to it? Four ideas, four chapters. Let's jump into this. Number one, uh, the place to find joy or the way that it is created is that we join together. We are, as we saw last week, a body. Every member matters. Every piece is important. The Apostle Paul wrote this in the first chapter of Philippians. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. So this phrase here I want to focus on, your participation in the gospel. And the question I want to try to answer for us this morning is, in what way did these Philippians, these Jewish converts, and then eventually non-Jewish Roman converts, In what way do they participate with the Apostle Paul in the gospel? Well, as I said just a moment ago, some who were living or visiting Philippi were the first in all of Europe to say yes to Jesus. The first convert to Christianity in all of Europe was a woman, Lydia. And uh, we read her account here, Acts chapter 16, verse 14. A woman named Lydia was listening. This is while Paul was in Philippi at the river. 
She was a seller of purple fabrics from the city of Thyatira, which is in modern day Turkey, and a worshiper of God. So she had reverence for God. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. What was Paul speaking? What things, of, of, of what things was he speaking? He was talking about Jesus and how he came to earth from heaven, how he took our sins with him to the cross and how he rose from the dead so that we might have forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. And, and, and it says here, the Lord opened her heart to respond. And anytime anybody responds to the gospel, it's because God has opened that heart. It's a divine work by the Lord himself. Now, there were some in Philippi who rejected the message. And uh, they persecuted the Apostle Paul and his team. They beat them, physically assaulted them, and imprisoned them because they were accused of stirring up riots in the city that had something that would maybe stick. And so they were thrown in prison. But as you know, if you know the account in the book of Acts, an angel came and released this, these men from prison. And the jailer that was there was terrified because the law in that culture was, if under your watch a prisoner escapes or is freed without the authorities giving freedom, then you were either to take your own life or we'll take it for you. So the, it was a death penalty for a, for a prison guard uh, to, to uh, if, if an inmate or someone uh, was, had escaped. And so we read further in Acts chapter 16, the jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, it could either be his physical life or his spiritual life. But Paul went spiritual. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of God to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. So we see that there are some who are beginning to respond to the gospel. And they are joining together with those who already believe. And a church is being formed. There's a small group of people. And as time goes on, we know that others were added. Others joined in. If you look back at the first verse in Philippians, in your Bibles there, in the introduction, the salutation, the apostle writes, Paul and Timothy... Bond servants of Christ Jesus, notice this, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. So this church has grown. There's a large enough congregation to have a leadership structure in place. And the, the apostle is writing a letter to them to tell them just how much he loves them and how much he appreciates their participation in the gospel. That's what he says right up there at the beginning. And so this church not only said yes to Christ, they not only responded to the gospel, but they learned how to participate in the gospel. We see that in chapter 2, verse 12. Just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, see this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Learn how to participate Learn how to live out the gospel. What I want to note here is that the Apostle Paul says to work out your salvation. He does not say to work for your salvation. As we showed earlier, it's a divine work that only God can do to open the heart. There are some who believe that I can open my own heart. You can't do that. It's only through God and his grace and his faith that he gives to you or the gift of faith that he gives to us so that we can say yes. And so once these Philippians responded to the gospel and uh, participated in the gospel, learning to live the life of Christ, then they continued to advance, uh, not only in their own growth, but they wanted to advance the gospel as well. So we see this in Philippians chapter 4, and verse 15. You yourselves also know, Philippians that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, which is northern Greece, 
No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you and loan, alone. Now, they were giving and receiving finances to fund Paul's ministry so that he can continue to travel, preach the gospel, and plant more churches. The Philippian church was the first church in Europe to do this. The first church in Europe to support a missionary, if you want to use that particular vocabulary, which is, which is fine. So the Philippians were the first to respond to the gospel, the first to live out the gospel, and the first to advance the gospel. And that brought not only the Apostle Paul, but the Philippians great joy. We're doing this. We're together on this. God is using us to change the world. And that brought a deep sense of satisfaction and joy uh, to all those involved. They were joined in one purpose, which is the next point here, one purpose. Joined together in one purpose. Chapter 2, verse 2. Make my joy complete. He says, I have joy. He already mentioned it earlier. But he said, build on it. Add to it. Make it complete. By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. Consider one another as more important than yourselves. This word mind is also translated in a couple of other places in the book of Philippians as attitude. Attitude. For example, we'll look at chapter 2, verse 5, just a couple of verses later. And he writes, Have this attitude or mind, same word in the original writing that the Apostle Paul penned, had this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Um, what attitude? We continue looking at the next verse. We saw this around Christmas time. When we did the message down from his glory. Philippians 2, how Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant. That's the attitude. That's the mindset. Jesus emptied himself of his godhood when he became a human. He set aside every right, every privilege, every dimension of power that belongs to him as the eternal God and chose himself to limit, chose for himself to limit himself and humble himself as a servant for all humanity. And we saw in that message, and it applies even today still, that the application for us to be humbled and our purpose here is to empty ourselves of ourselves. Uh, that's humility. Uh, that is our purpose as a church. And that is the mindset, that's the attitude that we ought to have is to consider others as more important than yourselves to serve one another. And uh, this same idea of purpose, same mind, same attitude uh, is found in other key verses. We saw it in the, in the key verse for this point. I just referred to it a moment ago. Do nothing, nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. Consider one another as more important than yourselves. Every now and then I hear other leaders, other pastors say things and it just the line will stick with me and I can't let it go and it just haunts me and it just becomes a part of my life and my thinking and hopefully God will use, change me to help me to become who God wants me to be. I remember listening to John MacArthur at a conference one time speaking and he made this comment. He says, I don't know that I've ever done anything with a pure motive. That haunts me because I think it's true for me. Have I ever done anything with a pure motive? See, this verse challenges us to think about why are we doing what we're doing? I think the only one who ever did anything with a pure motive was Jesus when he humbled himself and took on the form of a bondservant. He did it for his father. He did it for us. 
So, you know, another, another person is Rick Warren. I don't agree with everything that Rick does, but he's, he's done a lot of things that are amazing to advance the kingdom of God. He wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. Some of you maybe know the first sentence in that book. Four words. It's not about you. Nothing is. Nothing in this life, nothing in the life to come. None of it is about us. It's about Jesus. That's where the Apostle Paul wants us to go in our attitude. It's always about Jesus. Always. It's Jesus first, others second. <laughs> if there's anything left over, you get the leftovers, right? This is not original with me, but maybe you've seen this since we're talking about joy. This is at the heart of it. Jesus first, others second, you last. There's a really good book out there. It's a secular book on leadership. It's called Leaders Eat Last. And a, a big trend in leadership in the world today is they're beginning to explore this idea of servant leadership. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> but the world is beginning to see the value in that. And there is. Number three, yield to Jesus. Remember, it's all about him. It's not about us. Chapter three, verse eight. I count how many things? All things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Lord means he is in charge. He is the boss. Now, when these words were written and when they were translated into English, it was primarily for people who understood what a king and a queen and lords and ladies were all about. These were people in authority. In our culture, the Lloyd paraphrase would say, knowing Christ Jesus as my resident president. He lives in my life and he's in charge of my life. He calls the shots when I'm right with him. I have a brother-in-law uh, who uh, at one time was uh, managing a plastics factory. And we were talking about one day what he does at work and they bring in pallets, hundreds of tons of little plastic pellets, a variety of different colors, all sorted out. And they, they heat these pellets, they melt them down, and they put them into an injection mold, and they create a variety of objects. And Duffy was saying to me that we take the raw materials, we add value, and then we ship them out for a profit. And he said, that's kind of like the church, isn't it? And, you know, I haven't really thought about all of you as like plastic pellets, but he's not really too far off. He's, he's way off on the plastic pellet part. But he said, Here's, here, this, isn't this what you do? You bring the people in, you add value, and you ship them out? I said, well, yeah, kind of, but I was still stuck on the plastic pellet type thing. Okay. He was talking about discipleship helping people grow spiritually. And if you want to say that we're adding value, that's flawed. That's fine as long as the, it is the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. There's the value that we add. We want you to know Jesus. That's it. That's the only thing. We want you to know him. And so if that is the value in this verse, what is the loss to which he's referring? There's a sharp contrast happening in these verses. So you look up at the previous verse, and he said, whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss. Why? Because of Christ. Once Paul discovered Jesus, his whole life was transformed. Because up to this point, he thought the things that were gained to him were all the behaviors the attitudes, the action, the education, whatever it might be that would impress God. God's not impressed. He's not impressed. All these things that Paul thought that he could do to demonstrate to others 
his righteousness in order to impress others. Listen, we talked about this recently here as well. People aren't impressed. They're more impressed with themselves than they are with you. Stop trying to impress people. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. So all the things that the Apostle Paul did to try to impress God and impress others, he came to the realization that I'm, I was wasting my time. It was a wasted effort. There is zero value in that. None. Until he learned how to yield to Jesus. Then that was where his life was transformed. Okay, we're going to go to the fourth and final chapter of Philippians, and it's all about standing firm. <laughs> standing firm. 4 1 simply says, a phrase in that verse simply says, Stand firm in the Lord. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read the Bible, I like to read what's not in there. Here's what I mean by that I read this verse, and it stands, it says, Stand firm in the Lord. It does not say, Stand firm in your opinions. Does it? No. It doesn't say stand firm in what you think is best. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say stand firm in what you want for yourself. It doesn't say stand firm with your plan A. It doesn't say that. It says stand firm in the Lord. So what does that mean? <laughs> what does that look like? Well, if you, and we're going to show you, we look at the rest of chapter 4, and twice we find this phrase, in the Lord. So this chapter begins with the challenge, the command to stand firm in the Lord, and then I believe twice in the verses to follow, he shows us how to do that. Beginning in verse 2, live in harmony in the Lord. And we're to, we're to stick with that, we're to stand firm in living in harmony. Once again, notice what it doesn't say. It does not say live in uh, uniformity. It doesn't say that. In fact, harmony is quite the opposite. We have some musicians in this room. Uh, I'm more of a drummer than a musician, but I know enough about music to know that harmony requires at least two different tones being played at the same time. That's harmony, if they're the right notes. <laughs> there can be disharmony or dissonance or whatever. Okay. Listen carefully. Harmony, which is what we're to strive for, uh, requires variation. Uniformity destroys harmony. Hear me out. Harmony thrives on individual differences. Every one of us is unique because that's the way God wants us to be. We have different personalities, different experiences, different levels of education, different spiritual gifts. No two of us are alike. If, if God wanted another person like you, there would be another person like you on the planet. I told my, we were talking about this with my grandkids recently. How God made each one of us so different, so unique. And I told one of my grandkids, I said, do you know what God said when he made you? No, what did he say? He said, I'll never do that again. <laughs> Which is true. Yeah. Yeah. And we explained a little bit of what that means and what that looks like. Why would he want to? He's got you and that's what he wants. He wants you to be you. So the church thrives on diversity. Harmony is such more beautiful than monotony, monotone. The church is unified in truth. We have to have unity around truth. But we must also have a diversity in ideas and opinions. That's why we work together. That's why one person does not run this church. I don't do this by myself. I do this with you, you do this with me. We have a board of directors, I'll be meeting with them today. They are the ones to whom I am accountable and I serve at their pleasure. I'm not autonomous, I'm not independent. We work 
together. And there have been times when what I would present in a meeting uh, is not the decision that we make. It's not the direction that we go. That's fine. You know why? Because we came up with a better idea than I had on my own. And that, I, that better idea would not have been discovered if we had not been working differently, thinking differently about what it is we're discussing at the moment. So working together creates harmony. And I love it. And so does God. Here's the next thing, the final thing. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. That's one of the areas where we're to stand firm. It's like he's given us these two ideas, one for each foot, so you stand firm. It does not say rejoice that you got your way. It's not Christ-like. It doesn't say rejoice that the one who disagreed with you is gone. It's not godly. We rejoice in Jesus. In Jesus. And we rejoice in Jesus only when our focus is on Jesus. But once that focus begins to shift or drift, man, we're headed for trouble. Headed for trouble. Okay. And when we focus on Jesus, it's okay for other people to see things differently than you. We're supposed to. This is what creates harmony. You know, we can have unity without uniformity. Uh, demanding uniformity limits our capacity to experience harmony. And it limits our capacity to rejoice. It can bring great sorrow instead. All right, if we're too focused on ourselves, the vision of Jesus has become blurred and we're missing the mark. So let's not be like that. Let's live in harmony. Let's rejoice in the Lord. And when we do, we're bringing joy to other people. Jesus first, others. And then whatever is left over, if there's anything left. And there won't be if you've emptied yourself, right? All right, so here's our takeaway. I'll make someone else's joy complete. Tell you what, uh, well, because of this verse, Philippians 2.2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Here's this idea. If every one of us came to church with the idea that the people I'm going to be with today are going to complete my joy, Everybody shows up as a consumer. Nobody arrives as a contributor. And we all leave empty. But if we come with this mindset on Sunday mornings or whenever we gather in whatever way, whatever place, I am, I am going to arrive at this place as a contributor. If every person had this mindset, that I will make your joy complete. If every person in this room came here with that mindset, wow. And I'm not saying that, that nobody does. I'm not saying anybody comes here as a consumer, but this is, this is of what we need to be reminded. Why do we gather? It's not just a cultural thing that you do on Sunday morning. It's because there's somebody in this room whose joy you can complete this morning by having a conversation, giving a word of encouragement, smiling, and I see a lot of smiles. I'm seeing more now. <laughs> okay? All right. Joy. Uh, it's what Christ has for us. And it's available, Philippians tells us, how to create it, where to find it, how to stand firm in it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this familiar book of Scripture. I uh, think the Apostle Paul wrote it for this church that he loved, a healthy church, a growing church, a church that made a difference, not only in that ancient Roman colony, but also here in Auburn, Washington. And uh, Paul had no idea that there was another several continents on a very large planet and millions, maybe billions of people 
would be reading these words, Lydia had no idea that she would be such an inspiration to so many people, including our own Kathy Jones. But when you opened her heart and she received Christ and was baptized there in that river, and we don't know how many people will be influenced by Kathy's testimony or anybody else's testimony in this room. Um, it's really not ours to know. Ours instead is to be focused and to be faithful and to be fruitful. That's, that's one of the mantras here at Cascadia Church. It's one of the reasons we exist. It's one of the reasons we're looking at this book of Philippians this morning. What do you have for us, God? What do you have to say? And I believe you've spoken. Thank you. May we listen. May we learn new and creative and fresh ways to put this into practice, even this morning. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's say goodbye to those that are watching. Here you go.